When I was 14, one of my fondest memories is the moon landing on July 20th, 1969. At the time of Neil Armstrong's first steps, I was in a bowling alley called West Side Lanes. I was not old enough to be in the bar where the TV was located, but the lanes connected to the bar with a window and we could see from there. When these famous words were heard, I'm going to step off the limb. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The place that went one crazy. Small step for man. It was about 11 o'clock on a Sunday night. It was summertime, and many businesses were not open the next day to celebrate. After all, this was the greatest accomplishment in the history of mankind. President Nixon closed all public businesses, including the draft offices. Only an earth-changing event could do this. I could not have been happier. We really landed on the moon, and I was lucky enough to see it. Just four days earlier, my mother and I used a ragtag telescope, and we thought we saw the tail flame as Apollo 11 took off for the moon. Another very fond memory of mine. The moon landing, without a doubt, was a shining star of accomplishment for the decade. This was the late 1960s. I was days away from my 15th birthday. The war in Vietnam was raging. Every night the television was filled with battle or riot video. It seemed every week another GI in our area came back home, either missing a limb or two or in a bag. Many times it was someone you recognized. My friends and I were already trying to figure out what we were going to do after graduation. Remember, the draft was still alive. Those who did not follow the rules of the draft were arrested and thrown in jail. I have asked the commanding general, General Westmoreland, what more he needs to make aggression. He has told me, and we will meet his needs. I have today ordered to Vietnam the Air Mobile Division and certain other forces which will raise our fighting strength from 75,000 to 125,000 men almost immediately. Additional forces will be needed later, and they will be sent as requested. This will make it necessary to increase our active fighting forces by raising the monthly draft call from 17,000 over a period of time. Once the communists know as we know that a violent solution is impossible, then a peaceful solution is inevitable. The only alternative was to go to college. To go to college, you also needed money. This country, this country was a powder keg with a short fuse and many volunteers with a lit match. The decade began with a warning from Dwight Eisenhower, better known as Ike. Let's listen to what Ike had to say. Now this conjunction of an immense military establishment and a large arms industry is new in the American experience. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. Our toil, resources, and livelihood are all involved. So is the very structure of our society. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. 
so that security and liberty may prosper together, a substitute for intellectual curiosity. For every old blackboard, there are now hundreds of new electronic computers. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. Ike warned us, us the citizens of the military-industrial complex. Let's take a look at what Wiki has to say about it. The military-industrial complex, MIC, is an informal, and I repeat, informal alliance between a nation's military and the arms industry which supplies it, seen together as a vested interest which influences public policy. Hmm. A driving factor behind this relationship between the government and defense-minded corporations is that both sides benefit, one side obtaining war weapons and the other being paid to supply them. Now this... This is a recipe for disaster. It is obvious Ike was warning us of oncoming danger. One other thing he said caught my attention. He said while holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive. The captive of a scientific technological elite. Not only was he warning of unnecessary future wars because of the greed money can produce, he was also warning us to hold scientific research accountable. I feel the key word he used was captive. The free dictionary says captive means to be taken and held prisoner as in war, restrained by circumstances that prevent free choice, serving a single company exclusively. It is interesting to me, Dwight Eisenhower, a two-term president, winning both elections by a landslide, who held the love of the citizens, which he would, in his last days of power, warn the people he also loved, the fox is in the hen house, because nobody is watching, or nobody cares. And that nobody, folks, is us. <laughs> On September 12, 1962, President John F. Kennedy made a famous speech at Rice Stadium. Let's listen to parts of that speech. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal, will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. But if I were to say, my fellow citizens, that we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket, more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses, several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food and survival on an untried mission 
to an unknown celestial body and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this, and do it right, and do it first before this decade is out, then we must be bold. I'm the one who's doing all the work, so uh, we'll get voice to stay cool for a minute. However, I think we're going to do it. And I think that uh, we must pay what needs to be paid. I don't think we ought to waste any money, but I think we ought to do the job. And this will be done in the decade of the 60s. It may be done while some of you are still here at school at this college and university. It will be done during the terms of office of some of the people who sit here on this platform. But it will be done. And it will be done before the end of this decade. And I am delighted that this university is playing a part in putting a man on the moon as part of a great national effort of the United States of America. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said, because it is there. Well, space is there. And we're going to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there. And new hopes for knowledge and peace are there. And therefore, as we set sail, we ask God's blessing on the most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. Thank you. A moving speech, to say the least. From the time of this speech, most Americans could not get enough of space. The manufacturing of space toys went through the roof. People were using space as a theme for their style of dressing. Anytime a manufacturer associated their product with the exploration of space, it added the feeling of quality to the customer. Here are some short clips I found in a Frigidaire commercial. Now to put the finishing touches on the dessert for Susan's party this afternoon. Not too surprising for this day and age, little space capsules of ice cream and cookies, topped with a cherry and a little candle. They'll keep frozen until ready for the party in the freezer portion of her refrigerator. No frost ever here. Now, out to play, young lady. They say the space voyager will create his own environment of carefully determined temperature. But even those who stay at home on Earth can select their favorite indoor weather all year round. In space, they keep the sub-zero temperatures outside the capsules. But here in this new food freezer, cold temperature is welcome, and the zero zone inside keeps the frozen food safe. Dessert time at the party next door. All right, Susan, you can be the delivery lady from Mars with a cargo of ice cream capsules. Capsules you can eat and space music with a beat for the young generation home from a far out party of their own. But mother has learned to keep plenty of refreshments on hand to meet their earthly needs. They've just invented a new dance. It's called Walk in Space. I found it interesting when JFK was describing the challenges of getting to the moon and how engulfed the audience was at the time. 240,000 miles to the moon, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall made of new metal alloys, some of which have not been invented. Fitted together with the precision of the world's finest watch, then returning to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere causing the heat about half that of the temperature of the sun. It has not been invented yet? Where the heck did JFK get all this colorful information to share and to help get everyone else involved? Well, it looks like JFK has made a trip or two to NASA and spoke with none other than Warner Von Braun. In future conspiracies, we'll look closer at Warner Von Braun and Operation Paperclip. To me, 
he was nothing more than a hood ornament, meaning he made things look good, but he had little to do with the function of the vehicle. For example, when a company has a potential customer visit, the company will use an employee who can woo the customer into buying their product to show everyone around. This is who the smooth Warner Von Braun was to the space program. He and many of his colleagues came to the United States from Germany shortly after the Second World War. He worked in Germany as one of the scientists behind the V-2 bombs. He sold the idea to Adolf Hitler. After the war, he worked on our missile programs and in 1958, he and his group of engineers and scientists unified to help form NASA. Yes, the world's greatest space program was started by a group of Nazis. Remember what Ike said about scientists. On November 22, 1963, John Kennedy was assassinated in broad daylight by, I feel, the same military-industrial complex Ike spoke of three years earlier. One of the first changes in policy Lyndon Baines Johnson made after taking office was to increase our involvement in Vietnam. However, we were not at war until the 1964 Gulf of Tonkin incident was staged. It was suspected as a false flag for a very long time. A false flag is when one country creates conflict and then puts blame of the conflict onto another country. In this case, the North Vietnamese, who now we know never fired upon the USS Maddox as our government said they did. It is unclear if Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, relayed the correct information to LBJ in a timely manner or not, but it is proof the upper levels of our government knew the truth but still allowed the country to head into a long and ugly war. After the Civil Rights Act of 1964, some areas of the country were not quite ready to change their ways and riots broke out all over the country. On April 13, 1964, one of the first and most widely known riots broke out in Watts, Los Angeles. Then on March 13, 1965, riots broke out again in Watts due to claims of cruel and unusual punishment towards African Americans. At this time, there were many more riots breaking out all over the country. On April 4, 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. Reports of over 100 riots broke out. James Earl Ray was blamed, admitted guilt, and sentenced to 99 years in prison. Since the death of James Earl Ray in prison, the FBI and Memphis police have admitted their involvement in the assassination. Once again, the public was misled by our government. Shortly after midnight on June 5, 1968, presidential candidate Robert Kennedy was shot three times and died two days later. The official story says he was shot by Saran Saran, another lone assassin. Is there a pattern forming with these lone assassins? In 1963, Betty Friedan published her book, The Feminine Mystique. A year ago, this woman heaved a brick through the rose-colored picture window of the American suburban bungalow and invited the resident housewife to take a clear look at the outside world. This book has sold more than 50,000 copies in the hardcover edition and 700,000 have been published in paperback. The feminine mystique has made us feel it's unfeminine to use our rights, to really want equality, to want to take part in the decisions of the world in politics. Career woman almost became a dirty word. A woman today uh, has been made to feel freakish and alone and guilty if she, simply she wants to be uh, more than her, uh, her husband's wife, her children's mother, if she really wants to use her abilities in society. I first read The Feminine Mystique in the winter of 1964 I felt personally judged. All these things that women at home can do, which are extremely worthwhile to society, were dismissed as dilettantism and unworthy of any respect. However it was received, Betty Friedan's book was certainly timely, as women's rights was beginning to surface as a national issue. It's 1969. The women's rights movement was in full swing. We were in a Cold War 
race for space, and the Russians had been the world leaders. Not only was the protest to the Vietnam War occurring in the United States, it was happening all over the world. The Jim Crow laws and segregation were in the forefront. The country's shining hope for the future, Ted Kennedy, was under investigation for a possible murder associated with the Capriquitic accident. By the time July 1969 came around, we, the people, were ripe for the picking. The president now is Richard Milhouse Nixon. Granted, these issues were dumped into Nixon's lap, but it was his decision to make. Now I ask you, if you were the president of the United States at this time, and you had an opportunity to give the people of the world hope for a brighter future, even though you knew it was an impossible mission, what would you do? Growing up, I was engulfed into the entire space program. I can remember the picking of the Mercury astronauts. I read every article I could find. When something space was on television, I made sure I was home to see it. I can thank Disney for much of my space education. I will get into Disney's involvement in later conspiracies. I know my family was into it too, and in school we talked about it a lot. We all needed something inspiring to talk about, and most people of the world felt the same. So, could the moon mission have been faked to help heal the world for one reason? Yes, in my opinion, this is just what occurred. But for other reasons also, we will discuss in the future. The moon missions were to last another three years. This could also do well at re-election time for President Nixon. I am not a crook. Other than the motivational reasons we just reviewed, here are a few of my favorite bits of evidence I feel prove we never went to the moon. After the alleged moon landing by Apollo 11, astronauts Neil Armstrong, Edwin Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins made a world tour. During this world tour, they gave away moon rocks to the countries they visited. It appears they gave a very special moon rock to the Netherlands. In 2009, the rock was inspected and it turned out to be petrified wood. Yeah, it is possible someone planted petrified wood in, the sa in their Santa's bag of rocks, but highly unlikely. During their moon landing tour, they gave away rocks to more than 100 other countries. I find it interesting, no other country they gave rocks to had theirs tested. After all, it could be proven it came from somewhere other than Earth. That would end all the controversy, or at least chill it down some. But no other country has tested a rock to date, or at least reported the findings. Could it be they are afraid of what they may find? or what they will do with the results. At 10 a.m. Central Daylight Time, August 12, 1969, the Apollo astronauts held their first press conference. They were released from quarantine just two days earlier. They were very well rested after spending just over two weeks being not real busy. Let's take a quick look at that conference. Stop the video right there. Now folks, take a good look at these guys. They are fully rested military guys in their late 30s and just returned from the greatest feat of mankind. They have accomplished something man has been dreaming of since our beginning. And this is how they act? They should be walking in hands clasped and raised over their heads and all you can see is teeth. Let's continue. The format today will consist of a 45-minute presentation by the Apollo 11 crew, followed by question and answer. At this time, I'd like to introduce the Apollo 11 crew, astronauts Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, Edwin Aldrin. Neil? It was our pleasure to have participated in one great adventure. It's an adventure that took place not just in the month of July, 
but rather one that took place in the last decade. We all here and the people listening in today had the opportunity to share that adventure over its developing and unfolding in the past months and years. It's our privilege today to share with you some of the details of that final month of July that was certainly the highlight for the three of us of, of that decade. We're going to divert a little bit from the format of past press conferences and talk about the things that interested us most, in particular the, the uh, things that occurred on and about the moon. We will use a number of films and, and slides, which most of you have already seen. And with the intent of, of pointing out some of the things that we observed on the, the spot, which may not be obvious to, to those of you who are, who are uh, looking at them here from the surf surface of Earth. number of minutes behind schedule. Is that because the schedule was overloaded for the EVA, or can we expect all astronauts, when they reach the moon for the first time, to enjoy themselves and, and spend as much time doing so as you seem to? Uh, we plead guilty to enjoying ourselves. Okay, uh, okay. This is enough of this. It is painful to watch. The North Korean and Chinese military look happier. This is not a definitive proof of deception, but you have to feel something is not right. This bit of evidence came to light when I was a senior in high school. Our school received one book of pictures of the moon landings. My science teacher stood in front of the class to show the book of pictures to us. Everything was fine until this picture came up. This picture is called Earth Rise shot by the Apollo 8 astronauts on December 24th, 1968. This was the first actual picture of Earth I had seen. When I saw it, I raised my hand with this question. I thought the Earth was four times bigger than the Moon. The teacher said, well, yes it is. Then why does the Earth look the same size as the Moon does from Earth? My teacher stopped and looked at the picture and said, it must be because of the camera perspective. I accepted the answer at the time, never thinking the photo might be bogus. I'm going to use After Effects to demonstrate the size difference. This is the Earthrise photo from NASA's website. I drew an approximate mask around the Earth. That's good enough for this demonstration. Right now the scale is set at 100%. I'm going to increase it to 400% or four times larger. Now when I bring in the original photo again and lower the opacity, you can see how large I feel the Earth should look from the moon. Okay. One more piece of evidence. This piece involves someone I consider a champion when it comes to exposing the moon missions. He has produced movies on the subject. His name is Bart Zebral. The movie he produced that really made me think was Astronauts Gone Wild. I strongly suggest watching it. I will link to it and Bart's channel in the description. In this movie, Bart confronts Apollo astronauts and asks them to swear in the Bible they went to the moon. Let's watch a few of my favorite clips. <laughs> yeah, right here's fine. I'm Bart with ABC Digital. How are you doing? Um, I was given a classified tape from the Apollo program. It's 31 years old. It's an unedited reel, including outtakes from the mission. Hmm. 
Uh, it's got about 20 takes of a single shot of the mission. What mission? Apollo 11. Yes. And the photography is being forged in the mission. They're faking a shot of being halfway to the moon. And they refer to you on the tape as a shot that was done during Apollo 10, where you put a transparency over the window and move the camera of the Earth and move the camera back away from the window, turn off the lights in the spacecraft, and appeared to be halfway to the moon when in fact they were in Earth orbit. Huh, really? Yeah, and they said it was the same way that you did it on Apollo 10. So we wanted to give you the opportunity to put your left hand on the Bible, to raise your right hand, to swear to God. Stick it in your ear. Well, you were giving an opportunity to swear to God under oath that you walked on the moon. I don't do that kind of thing. Well, if you really walked on the moon, what's the problem of swearing to God that you did? Do you believe in God? You want me to knock you in the head? Well, I want you to, I want you to swear Get to God on the Bible you. that you Get walked on the moon. Okay. If you walked on the moon, we're given the opportunity to swear to God that you walked on the moon. I'm going to give you the opportunity to get the hell knocked out of you if you don't leave me alone. You have the opportunity to have $5,000. The meeting is not open. Well, you have $5,000 cash. You can give it to charity if you'd swear on the Bible that you Please. walked on the moon. Please I have give a it to charity. That'd be fine. Why don't you I swear won't. to... Why not? Why won't you do it? So why don't you put your hand on the Bible and swear to God that you walked Jim, on the moon? Mr. Seibel has made a fool of himself in front of the world. Mr. Seibel, you do not deserve answers. When it comes to the astronauts, I am torn in my feelings. On one hand, I feel sorry for them having to live a lie. On the other hand, they were my childhood heroes. Alan Bean, John Young, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, even the Mercury guys, John Glenn, Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, all those guys. They did give a young man something to think about, and now I know it was a lie. Thank you for watching. I hope this video inspires you to do research and conclude your own answers. Until next time, peace.